This is part two of our considerations on authority and asking the question, do Christians have authority over the enemy? Uh, the last time we recognized that Jesus is utterly, utterly sovereign and supreme over the enemy, even to the point of sustaining their breath and their lungs, um, that, you know, they don't have lungs because they're spirits, but metaphorically speaking, he sustains them, and if he didn't, they wouldn't exist anymore. And so we were reading from the footnote, Matthew 10, chapter 1, and part 3 of the book, and we are on the fourth point of that footnote, recognizing that Jesus gives authority to his brothers and sisters uh, to combat the activity of the enemy, and that that authority is not a blank check. It is never um, apart from the will of God. It is always sustained by his will and by his power. And if, frankly, if we're doing something apart from his power, he's not going to sustain it. And if he does sustain it, he's doing it for his glory, right? Ultimately to demonstrate his righteousness and our wickedness because we're strutting about thinking we're something when we're nothing, okay? So he always gives authority in the context of his will and his plan and his purpose. Um, Mark 16, verse 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe, and in my name shall they cast out devils. Um, I want to make a quick point about Mark chapter 16, because you'll read in many of the modern translations, which use the, some of the earlier manuscripts. Um, they will frequently have a note that says, These... Uh, verses are not included in the very earliest manuscripts, and and they 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 sound just so wise and so true. And it's like surely anything these guys say is true, and maybe we don't even need the Bible. Like we just need to do whatever these guys say. I mean, I'm exaggerating, right? But um, it turns out that the vast majority of manuscripts that um, were distributed over Christendom, and so. Syria, Greece, manuscripts in Latin, um, thousands, tens of thousands of manuscripts all over the ancient world included the, all, the full version of Mark chapter 16. And it's only these early manuscripts um, that do not include it. In which case, then, the, the best evidence suggests that the early church accepted... Mark chapter 16 as legitimate and authoritative, which is why they kept copying it in the vast majority of um, Greek manuscripts, right? And so for the, the haughty and arrogant, self-serving, self-worshipping scholars of the day to say, and, and they do rightly say, it is not in the earliest manuscripts. That's not true. Or that is true. That is technically correct. But it doesn't mean that it is not inspired, and it, and it certainly doesn't mean that the early church did not recognize it as inspired, which is why they put it in the vast majority of manuscripts, right? And so, uh, my argument is that, that, that this verse in Mark 16, 17 is utterly authoritative and utterly legitimate, and um, Satan is always coming up with a way to try and undermine Scripture, Jesus, right? He's always trying to come up with a way to undermine Scripture. And if he can use the stunner erudite scholars of the day in order to do it, 100%, 100% he's going to do that. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And then he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Um, we're going to see this, this property again, but notice when he says, well, first of all, uh, over all the power of the enemy, we recognize that all scripture is simultaneously true. And so that when he says this, there are caveats. For example, um, some demons only come out by prayer and fasting, right? And also, we acknowledge 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where God sent a thorn in Paul's flesh, a messenger from Satan. And Paul, if there is anybody who's ever had any spiritual authority as, an, as a true apostle of God, 
he surely would have had the authority to cast that messenger of Satan out. But because God sent the messenger of Satan, and it was God's will for the messenger of Satan to stay, Paul did not have the ability to contravene God's authority because authority comes from God. It does not come from Paul and it does not come from you or me. It comes from God, right? And so if God sends a demon, we can rebuke that devil night and day and day and night for a thousand years and it won't go anywhere. And we'll go somewhere way quicker than that demon will go somewhere. Let me tell you, okay? So the point is, is that authority, authority comes from God. And so we recognize that while Jesus says... Uh, over all the power of the enemy, that is according to his will that he does it, right? And of course, we, we acknowledge he's the one who's speaking, and so he's the one who's giving the authority. He's not writing a bunch of, oh, you just go do whatever you want to do. You go command a demon to give you a billion dollars. Like, no, that's ridiculous, right? Our opposition to the enemy and any opposition that we can, any resistance that we can give to the enemy is for God's glory and God's plan and God's purpose and not for us strutting about, supposing ourselves to be something when he's nothing. Um, God gives armor to protect his children from the schemes of the devil. And so uh, Ephesians chapter 6 verses 12 through 18, I'm not going to read that verse. And so, the point of the, the last video and then this one that I'm making so far is that Jesus has all authority. And so, if, if we are to have authority over the devils, and of course, I just read the two principal scriptures um, along with um, us recognizing, for example, in Matthew 10, chapter 1, or chapter 10, verse 1, that he gave his disciples authority over the enemy— um, we recognize that God does give a measure of authority over the enemy to his children, but he does it for his purposes and for his glory. Um, and so the next thing... to point out with respect to uh, operating in God's authority because it comes from him, is that we are to operate in an attitude of submission and humility. And so, James 4, 7, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Some verses read, Humble yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Unfortunately, I've heard like a, lo a number of, of pastors just say, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And I'll tell you this, you resisting the devil, you know, you know, they claim it's a promise from God, but they take it out of context, right? The verse has more than just resist the devil. It says, submit yourselves to God. And so you're resisting the devil in a heart of submission and humility and brokenness before God. The one sacrifice that he will never reject is a broken spirit and a contrite heart, right? You're not strutting about, I decree, I decree. That's, that, where's the humility? There isn't any humility. There's self-sufficiency and there's pride and there's entitlement, Right? But um, God is saying, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And an, an, an interesting recognition um, in Luke chapter 10, the verse that I had just read. So Luke 10, verse 20. Notwithstanding this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you. And so that word subject unto you in the Greek and the word submit and submit yourselves, therefore, to God, it's the, it's the exact same word. And so my point is this. As you submit yourself to God, the demons are subject. Jesus, the demons are subject unto you. As you humble yourself before God, the demons are subject unto you. As you strut about and decree, I am a king's kid. Don't you know who I am? In, in this kind of pomp, absurd pomp. Not recognizing that you're a sinner. Not recognizing that you deserve to the deepest level of hellfire just to knock you down. But supposing you're something when you're nothing, the demons will eat you. Satan loves pride. And he'll chew you up, spit you out, then chew you up and spit you out again. And I speak from experience because there have been, there was one time several years ago whenever I was kind of in this kind of proud attitude and I, I, I actually challenged the devil. And so can you imagine? All right, the devil 
is invisible, immortal, supernatural, and he has thousands of years' experience manipulating people. Okay, He is utterly subject to God, as I've said over and over again. But I challenged the devil... And he knocked me down. <laughs> he knocked me down. Me strutting about and I got dog manure right on my face. Okay. And it was in my brokenness before God and crying out to God that he restored me and set me back up again. This, this attitude of I am entitled to trap it on your face. Now Paul does write in Romans chapter 16. The God of peace. Not you. The God of peace will soon trample Satan beneath your feet. Right? This kind of um, hearkening back to Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Um, he will crush his head and he will bruise his heel. Um, Satan will bruise Christ's heel, but Christ will bruise Satan's head or crush his head. Right? And so ultimately, it is God who defeats the enemy, not us. It is God who gives authority over the enemy, not somehow authority just flows through my being or something. That's just absurd. And so if, if God wants to use the devil to teach you a lesson, to knock you down, that you would uh, obey um, the Apostle James when he says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I think that God is honestly very happy to do it because... He's teaching you a lesson. He's teaching you the lesson that ultimately authority comes from God and doesn't come from you, right? And so you are, if you are rebuking the devil, you're doing it in the context of being humble and submitted to God. And the point, resist the devil, what I find a lot of times is it, that is in the context of abiding. Like it is not just like a submit yourself before God. Okay, <laughs> like that's or something like you conjure up some kind of thing. Resist the devil may be using authority, but it may not. I, I've had God say to me sometimes whenever the devil is tempting me to despair, he just said, "Have faith." There was one one time that a, that I was downtown doing ministry and a guy basically put a curse on me and I, I was having very dark thoughts and, and even into the next day, which was Sunday, it was, it was hard to get through it and I, and I was just worshiping and I just felt like I said, just have faith. And it's just like the moment, like, like just believe that, that it's, it's over. And I was like, okay. And I did. And, and all immediately when I did that, the struggle was just gone. Like it was like almost like it had never even been there. And I didn't I sit there in the name of Jesus. Like I didn't sit there and do any of that. Bleed the blood. I command you. None of that. Now, now I do that a lot, but in this one, and again, it's the, it's in the context of authority and submission. God said, just have faith. And I had faith in the, and the moment that I obeyed God and rested on his promise, whoop, it was gone. Like it was never even there sucker punch, punch right in the throat or whatever, you know, it was just gone. There was another time that God said, ignore it. Jesus. And I think he probably had to say that to me twice. I don't know, probably, but just ignore it. And I just ignored it and, and it was just better. And so the, the point is, is that um, authority over the enemy is in the context of the spiritual gifts, in the context of listening to God's word and following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And as we obey what it is that God tells us to do in that moment, this is what it means to resist the devil. The submission to God is in the context of abiding and fellowship and intimacy, right? And in that place where God is communing with you and he's teaching you and he's strengthening you, he's sustaining you, that is where he gives his grace and it may be that you don't even do anything. Frankly, a lot of times that, the, that I was in despair and, and trusted God and turned to God, God just did whatever he did and it, it just was gone. Okay? And I, I didn't do anything. I didn't, I'm a king's kid. Don't you know who I am? I didn't do such a thing. God did it. And so re the, resisting the devil is in the context of us listening to the voice, that still small voice, Jesus, and teaching us what it is that we must do in that moment. And that's a kind of, you know, remember Jesus said, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. That picture 
is a picture of Jesus giving you the authority that you need in the moment. Recall that he also says um, that um, temptations are common to men, but he will show you a way out. And so in the moment, whenever you're in despair and in temptation, and God can speak to you and show you what the way out is. But again, that comes in a context of intimacy and fellowship and abiding.